The following training program was produced by the Tree Care Industry Association as an educational tool for industry professionals. The presentation contains scientific information combined with case studies. They serve to reinforce the need for professional arborists to conduct tree risk assessments before working on any tree. As with any educational material on the subject, this information is not intended to be the sole source of tree risk assessment training. It is provided as a supplemental aid in order to raise awareness and to emphasize the need for all arborists to implement an in-depth tree risk training program. TCI would like to recognize the F.A. Bartlett Tree Expert Company for sharing important research on the phenomena of tree failure with the entire industry in its continuing effort with TCIA to educate industry members and improve safety for all workers. We would especially like to recognize the contributions of Dr. Thomas Smiley at the Bartlett Tree Research Lab and Mr. Joe Bones, Safety and Training Coordinator in Bartlett's Mid-Atlantic Region. I would like to discuss the importance of assessing tree defects and hazards before climbing and working on trees. All too often when arborists approach a tree, they are most interested in completing the job on time, and all too often arborists have perished doing tree work. These incidents are often the result of a tree collapsing or some part of the tree failing while a climber is in the tree. No matter how much we think we know and how experienced we are, the unexpected can happen. Obviously, this little guy was an expert at what he does. On this particular day, things did not go his way. This can happen to us. It's often routine events or jobs that cause surprises. We tend to plan fairly well when we are faced with demanding removals or enormous takedowns with cranes or other special equipment. When we go out to tackle that average or routine job, however, we tend to let our guard down a little bit and may not examine closely enough for hidden defects that may be present. Our main consideration in this session is in accurately identifying tree defects and predicting whether they would cause the tree to fail while climbers are in the tree. We have a model based on three components necessary for trees to fail. First, we have to have a force. A typical force that we consider is the wind. Climbers also put force on a tree, either by climbing it or by lowering off of it. From an arborist perspective, that force is a bit different. Secondly, we have tree structure to consider. Arborists are concerned with the ability of a tree's structure to hold loads. And third, we need a weakness. There has to be something wrong with the tree for it to fail at a given point under your weight or the weight of lowering. What you should be most concerned about is what we call the weak tree model. In this model, the tree has an extreme weakness. Normal trees usually won't fail. You know this because you have been up hundreds of them. When a tree has a major defect, that overrides everything else. That is the one that may kill you. Fortunately, they are not all that hard to detect. First are the critical risk trees. Failure of these trees is imminent. A critical risk tree is going to come down very soon, whether it is triggered by your own weight, storm loads, or maybe on a calm day, gravity will even pull it down. Next are the high risk trees. With these trees, failure will happen, but is most likely to occur during extreme weather. You can usually work in high-risk trees without major concern, but differentiating between critical risk and high-risk trees is very important to tree climbers. Then we move down to moderate risk trees. These are the ones that will take extreme conditions to be brought down, such as a tornado or hurricane. Lastly, consider low-risk trees. They may fail if the conditions are bad enough, but not in the near future in most cases. When most people walk up to a tree, they look up first. To assess a tree for hazards, let's start our inspection at the root and soil area around the tree. It's important to have a systematic way to look at trees, and we would suggest that this is the place to start. Look at the roots and soil around the tree first, then work your way up. Go around the stem and take a look for defects there. Finally, examine what most people do first, which is the major branches and the crown. You need to do this for every tree you climb. It's not usually the big ones that hurt and kill people. It's the medium-sized ones, the everyday trees, that tend to cause more problems. So what should the root and soil inspection consist of? We want to see the trunk flare and the root collar, the buttress roots of the tree. Virtually every tree species that we work with has buttress roots. 
These are the major roots that provide a lot of support for the tree. They are a swollen area and you should be able to see that area at the base of the tree. We also want to look at the site to see if there is evidence of recent cutting of roots or missing roots. Often if a root was cut a number of years ago, there won't be any sign of the trench left, but there may be root decay working into the trunk. There may be a remnant of the root left. Look for missing roots and root cuts. Fungal fruiting structures are a real key to decay. They may not be obvious since they may be dried up. On many trees, there is evidence that they were there at one time or another. Decay is a major factor that we may find in many of these accidents. Often a tree is seriously decayed, and that decay is not readily visible. Then, there are cracks in the soil. Cracks may indicate that the tree is moving more than normal. If you have soil cracks near buttress roots, they indicate that the tree is moving, and something might be wrong. Excess water is a factor that we're seeing more frequently. More landscapes are getting irrigation and owners and managers of those properties tend to overuse irrigation. It's having a direct impact on the health of the tree and its root system. So first, examine the base of the tree. If you're a climber, you have to see the base of the tree before going up. If it's buried, as it is in the lower right picture, or hidden by other vegetation, as it is in the left or upper right, you have to be sure nothing is hidden underneath. You can see what is peeking out at the base of the upper right picture. There is some serious decay occurring there. You really need to look at this tree more carefully. Clear away the ivy or other vegetation to make sure the trunk is sound. A study was done a number of years ago after Hurricane Fran hit North Carolina. It was found that around one third of the trees that had failed had a root collar that had been buried. This has become a common occurrence. A buried root collar is a major indicator that the tree is weakened. Trees may put out adventitious roots to compensate, but those roots rarely compensate for the loss of holding ability in the buttress root system. There are other things that we should look for. On the upper left is a characteristic called an elephant's foot because it swells out abnormally. Anytime you come up to a tree that has an abnormal swell, look more carefully at that tree. On the lower right, we see fused roots. Quite often, serious root decay is present in fused roots. If you see one big root flare, do something to make sure that the area isn't totally hollow below. We have two basic types of root failures to be concerned with. One is indeed a root failure. That is where the root system breaks, and from a climber's perspective, it is the most common situation that you will run into. The root system is decayed, and that decay often works into the trunk. In this photo, you can see that the trunk broke, but it was caused by decay that started in the root system and worked into the trunk of the tree. The other type of concern is soil failure. From a climber's perspective, this isn't as important because we are not often out working in heavy storms. Saturated soils are a leading cause of soil failure. We can do a pretty good job of predicting root failures, yet we have a long way to go before we can predict soil failure. When we are examining a site, we want to look for cracks in the soil near trees. Soil failures are an extreme case of soil cracking where the buttress root is actually lifting out of the soil. When the tree starts leaning excessively, it is lifting up that buttress root. Cracks on the surface of the soil will tell you that this sort of scenario is occurring. The other thing that we have to be concerned about is root cuts. Root cuts occur in the urban environment fairly frequently. If we are cutting roots on just one side of the tree and we are out about five times the trunk diameter, we consider that as not having a real major impact on tree stability. Probably not even a major impact on long-term tree health if the roots are cut cleanly. In this range, we are cutting more lateral roots than buttress roots. In lateral roots, the tree can close off those wounds and regenerate. When cuts occur in the buttress roots, things are a bit different. The minimum offset we suggest for roots cut near a tree is about three times its trunk diameter. If you have a 36 inch diameter tree, you need to make that cut about nine feet from the trunk. At this point, we are right about at the end of the buttress root system, or the root plate. Therefore, our impact on stability is going to be minimal if only one side of the tree is affected. The long-term ramifications are not really known. Certainly, there is potential for decay to move in. If the cut is inside of that three times the trunk diameter distance, then we're looking at a much higher risk of failure, especially on a tree with a freshly cut root system. 
Cutting as few as one root too close to the tree can cause that tree to fail. You may have seen people trenching way too close and not showing any concern for the root system of the tree. You need to be looking for those recent trenches or cuts before going up into a tree. The long-term effect of root damage is typically root rot. The symptom of root rot may not be as obvious as the slide on the upper right. There will most likely be a few small fruiting structures evident. Later on in the season, we may not have any fresh fruiting structures. They are generally short-lived, lasting only about a week to a month. In the lower left photograph, we have removed bark to show you a fungal mat. This particular fungus is armillaria. On the lower right, you can see black rhizomorphs, or shoestrings, which are another form of armillaria. These are things we need to be looking for before we ascend. Look for the signs and symptoms of decay. Root decay works quite a bit differently than trunk decay. Root decay typically works from the tips of the roots, the fine roots, upward toward the trunk, and usually runs along the bottom of the roots. So it is actually in an area of the root that is hardest for us to see and hardest for us to detect. This pattern tends to be fairly consistent. Decay starts at the tips and works its way inwards along the bottom of the root. Root decay often extends into the stem. This is when we are most likely to get an unlucky climber or storm that will bring the tree down. This is the type of tree that really scares us. This is the tree that you can detect, and you need to detect this tree. When walking up to this tree, the first thing you can see is that no root flare is visible. You would be missing indicators of what is going on underneath the ground. Looking up, this tree does not have a huge crown, but the crown that is present has a healthy green color. So the drive-by arborist is going to say that this is a healthy tree, yet we could not see the root flare. That is the number one giveaway for the climber. If the root flare isn't visible, how can you inspect the root system of the tree? If we had done a sounding of this tree, there is enough decay that we would have heard it. This tree came over on a calm day. If a climber had gone up this tree, it may have failed under his own weight. Root failures tend to be the most damaging. You can see what happened when this tree fell down. It took out about half of a house. During the investigation, it was discovered that a root had been cut. This root bothered a neighbor of the house that had been destroyed, so they got out the chainsaw. They cut off one root and it caused the whole tree to fail. There were other factors involved, such as lean, but as few as one root cut too close to a tree can cause that tree to fail. Somebody cutting a root with a chainsaw is not a normal occurrence, but we have all seen people trenching without showing any concern for the root system of a tree and trenching very close. You need to be looking for these recent trenches before you go up in a tree. How do we inspect for root decay? Besides a visual assessment, we recommend that people take a mallet and sound the tree. If it is severely decayed, you can probably hear the hollowness. We also recommend probing when indicated with a very small diameter drill bit. By probing, we can determine exactly how much decay is in that root system. We then take the numbers and put them to work for us. We have broken down root risk into four levels. We have what we call a critical risk tree. That is a tree that has 50% or more of the roots with significant amount of decay, or has cuts within three times the trunk diameter through the roots. Even fewer roots need to be damaged if they are critical roots, such as roots opposite a leaning tree, or if they occur on the uphill side of trees on a slope. If we are cutting these critical roots, it will put the tree into this critical risk zone. We recommend not climbing these trees. Use an aerial lift, a crane, or some other mechanism. We also recommend not going up these trees because they could fail at any time. Our next category is high-risk trees. These are trees where we would often recommend removal to the client, but they can usually be worked in without a critical degree of risk. These trees have one-third of the root system decayed, missing, or severed. We recommend being conservative with these percentages if the tree were in a more important location. Moderate risk trees are trees that have some root decay. They will not usually fail under normal conditions. Rigging and lowering off of these trees is usually not a problem. Low risk trees will only go down in severe cases. Keep in mind, roots are very hard to examine from above ground. Therefore, be cautious when using these numbers. This accident case study involves three stems of an oak tree. At this point, they are three separate trees, 
Whether they all sprouted up from the same stump originally, we don't know, but they were growing very close together with large diameters. Two of the stems were dead. The third one was very much alive, and there were cables attaching all three together. It appears the crew decided to approach this job by removing the tops of the two dead trees first, with a climber tied into the live stem. He worked out the dead tops down to where the cables were, and then cut the cables. When he cut the second cable, the live stem of the tree fell over. The climber was killed in this case. He was located in the crotch designated by the white arrow. You can see a large limb above him that broke off and hit him so severely that he didn't survive. Sounding or drilling may have detected the thin shell surrounding the extensive decay in the base of this stem. With that information, another approach to removing this tree could have been considered. One option after determining the amount of decay would have been to remove extensive weight in the top of the live stem. Weight was a factor in it going over. If you look at the extent of decay, you can see that the tree may have gone over regardless of the weight being removed or not. Another point regarding cutting support cables. You really should get some slack in them before you cut them. You never know what will happen when you cut a cable. They are put there to strengthen a defect in the tree, and you have no idea of how much that defect may have progressed since the cable was installed. You have to pay attention to the base of trees to determine the presence and extent of decay. Too many times we see that clean shell and don't think there's a problem. In this case, it was a big problem. Our next area of examination is the trunk. We started at the roots and we're working our way up to the trunk. Cracks and seams are major factors, especially cracks. Look for decays and cavities and loose or dead bark. Fungal fruiting structures are a good indication that decay is present. We're learning more and more about the risks presented by codominant stems. Lean is another real factor. A tree that grew with a lean would have compensated for it, but when the canopy is off center, it puts more force onto the stem in one direction. A history of structural failures in a tree is also very important to look for. Previous failures are a strong indicator of future events. Next we have cracks and seams. On the right side we have a seam. It may have been caused by a frost crack. It may open and close slightly on a yearly basis. It's hard to say where it came from. Seams are not usually a big problem. Cracks are a real big problem, or at least could be a real big problem. On the left we have an active crack that is moving now. If cracks are associated with decay, or if they go all the way through the trunk, it indicates that the tree is going to fail in the near future. It often takes a couple of days for the tree to come down when cracks are active like this. Sometimes it takes a wind or loading event. When we see cracks, especially associated with decay, that tree is in the process of failing. Codominant leaders or codominant stems are known to be a weak area. Dr. Ed Gilman, a prominent researcher in arboriculture, has done work with small material looking at branch angles and the ratio of branch size to trunk size. He found that the smaller the branches are compared to the parent stem, the stronger the attachment is. When you see equal size codominant stems like the ones in this picture, we have a fairly weak attachment. They represent the weakest group. The industry is looking at codominant stems with and without included bark. Included bark codominants are a little bit weaker statistically, but the difference is not that great. Any time we have a codominant stem develop, we have a relatively weak attachment. It becomes scary if there is decay present as well. The case shown here, where we have decay associated with a codominant, is the weakest situation that we find. It could fall apart at any time without additional warning. Decay is sometimes obvious and sometimes not. If we have an opening to the outside like this, then it is a sure thing that we have decay. It then becomes a matter of determining how much sound wood we have how much decay is present, and what it all means. Decay starts with a wound and the tree's response to that wound. As decay progresses, it will move up and down most readily. Decay will move inward toward the center of the tree with intermediate ease, and the new wood that is formed after the wound is going to be the most decay resistant. Unlike roots, stems provide a known diameter and a well-defined area where decay may be present. We can measure and assess more things in a trunk than we can in a root system. We recommend sounding trees with a rubber mallet and listening for hollowness. If it is extremely hollow, you'll usually be able to hear that. Sound the root flares and the trunk. Start at the root collar and work your way up the trunk. 
If anything sounds hollow or there are other indicators of decay, drill and feel for changes in resistance to penetration. Other tools now available for this type of probing include the resistograph and the cyber drill. Sonic tomography is another emerging technology. These are all good methods to gather information when assessing decay in trees. How do we interpret the information gathered? There are charts like this one available that characterize acceptable amounts of sound wood for different threshold levels. High-risk trees generally need a consistent depth of wood that exceeds their stem diameter times 0.15. This is the same as Klaus Maddox's formula of radius times 0.3. In this country, we don't have radius tapes, we have diameter tapes, so it works better for us to do it on a diameter basis. For critical risk trees, the trees that we should not climb, we take that diameter number with no cavity opening and multiply it by 0.1. For instance, if we have a 30 inch diameter tree, we would generally classify it as a high risk if there is less than 4.5 inches of sound wood around the exterior of that tree. If there is less than three inches of wood, you should not be climbing that tree. These numbers are varied depending on cavity openings to the outside. If part of the stem circumference is missing, we have to reduce these numbers, and that is what the rest of the table shows. Decay evaluation involves considering many parameters, including its extent and location, along with tree characteristics, such as additional defects that may be present. Since we work outside, it is also relevant to consider weather conditions when a job is scheduled to be performed. We have a case study looking at stem failure in a 20-inch hickory that was about 95% dead. It appeared not to be too challenging a removal since there was a large open work zone to operate in. It later appeared that the climber looked around the base of this tree and thought he saw pretty sound conditions. He proceeded to climb the tree. Once he got about 40 feet up, the tree forked into two leads. The climber didn't ascend above the fork. The climber lowered a large section of the tree down in one piece. He positioned himself in the crotch by the blue spot in the near left of this photo. You can see the piece he cut on the right and the face cut on it. The right side of the slide shows the butt end of the tree and the amount of decay that was present. In this case, the type of decay is known as brown rot, which left the wood weakened but hard. If you were to do a sounding, it would give you a deceptive impression you actually have to probe brown rot to see how soft it is. In this case, the climber decided to take wraps instead of using a lowering device. With three wraps taken, the rope would not run to absorb any of the shock loading. It was all going to be transmitted right into the stem of the tree. When that occurred, the tree snapped off below him. He went down about 40 feet and died. This next incident was the result of undetected decay. This tree was a large white oak adjacent to an old farmhouse. A tornado had gone through this area and ripped off the top of the tree. A bucket truck was used to remove the damaged portion of the top. What you are seeing in these pictures are the results of the accident. The wound depicted is not from the tornado. Above where it says final cut, there was about a three foot piece of solid wood. The rip was not there yet, and it was solid above this section. It appears that the arborist cut back to a large leader without doing any weight reduction on the lead. As he finished the final cut, this large lead ripped out from the trunk and dropped to the ground. Luckily, his bucket was out of the way. If there had been another climber in this tree, we would have been looking at another fatality. Working our way up the tree, we have looked at the roots, looked at the trunk, and now we need to look into the crown. Obviously, dead branches and hangers can pose a risk. Abrupt bends, where a branch has broken out or where trees have been topped, quite often have poorly attached leaders or limbs that will continue to come off. Cracks are a defect that really doesn't get enough attention. They often result from overloading on one side of a branch or stem. When wood has compression on one side and tension on the other, cracks often form along what we call the neutral plane between the tension and compression wood. When cracks are present, they lead to drying of the wood, making it more brittle, therefore much more likely to fail. As with other parts of the tree, decay is something we need to be looking for. Our earlier case study shows that cables indicate a risk factor we need to consider. Previous limb failures also need to raise questions. Does the tree have a history of dropping its limbs? And if so, can you tell why? Then of course we need to look for nesting animals and insects. There are quite a number of animals and insects that can cause you problems. 
Hangers indicate dangerous branch defects and can come down at any time. Abrupt bends, as shown on the right, are going to be poorly attached with decay likely where the branches were initially broken or cut. The regrowth seen here has resulted in good sized branches that are much more likely to fail than a normal limb. When you have a tree with a history of major branch failure, there's an excellent chance that another one will come off as well. If you can't tell why the original failure occurred, then you're going to have to be extra careful. The architecture of a tree is structurally important. Trees like the depictions on the right or lower left present a problem. On the lower left, we see an off-center crown with all the weight flagging to one side. There is a lean in the trunk and decay is also present. With all these factors present, this is a tree we will most likely want to avoid climbing. You're probably going to want to use a crane or aerial lift. The pine on the right is a little bit harder to judge. It doesn't have much live crown ratio. We know that with less than about a third of the tree bearing foliage, or about a 30% live crown ratio, that tree becomes a higher risk. Since this tree has a ratio much less than 30%, it is at a higher risk. Then there are the insects and animals that we have to be concerned with. The video shows fire ants, which are moving up the east coast and are already well into Texas and the north. Even in northern climates, plant material that has moved up from the south often brings fire ants with it. They will probably be killed in the north by winter temperatures, but they still have three seasons to nest in trees. Like yellow jackets and hornets, fire ants will attack you when you are in their space. Even things like sounding are likely to stir up these insects' nests, so you would rather know about their presence before you leave the ground, rather than find out about them when you get up. With fire ants, inspect for their mounds and ant trails on the trunk. Some people are allergic to these insects and can go into life-threatening anaphylactic shock where they cannot breathe after being stung. So if you have this condition,